Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About Houses. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, today we're going to talk about foreclosures. This is a monthly update. Um, the specific article uh, we're going to get to in a minute, but Juana is dressed today. We're going to have fashion segment first. That'll be the first official thing. In the uh, that's in like a designer dress, right? It's got a famous name, designer, or no? If you say so. Oh, I thought it was one of the like labeled had a name. I mean, yeah, it's one of the designers at Dillard's. It's um, Antonio Milani. Ah, Antonio Milani. Okay. Um, busy day at work today. Yes. Right. Pre so you were on a pro standards hearing. You're mm -hmm. one of the hearing people. What is? Before we do this, we'll talk about pro standards. What is it, and what do you do? Like, what's the whole? What kind of things do you deal with at pro standards when you have a hearing? So that's a good question. So, um, so realtors have this wonderful code of ethics that we've had for about a hundred years mm -hmm. and we can self-regulate. So what happens is uh, when a member of the public has a complaint against a realtor, they file it with their association, association of realtors. The grievance committee looks at the complaint and says, hey, if this thing happened, is this a violation of the code of ethics? And if the answer is yes, then they forward the case to professional standards. Professional Standards has a panel of five members, and we hear the case. That means that we get the complainant and the respondent in front of us, and they make their case. We ask questions. They ask questions of each other. Uh, we tell them, thank you very much. They leave the room. We discuss. We vote. And we decide whether that realtor violated the Code of Ethics or not. If that realtor violated the Code of Ethics, then uh, we have several tools that we can uh, employ, anything from uh, a letter of warning, a letter of reprimand, continuing education, fine, suspension, mm -hmm. so all kinds of things. Um, this is how real realtors across the U.S. kind of self-regulate. Uh, that's not to say that each specific state does not also have their uh, division of real estate, uh, which is the governmental body that also regulates them. But for the most part, we self-regulate. Okay. What about arbitrations? What arbitrations between agents fighting over commissions? Right. So well, how does that work? Right. So we, we hear those. So for example, when, uh, when two or more agents uh, feel that they are entitled to, um, to the compensation that was offered and there's a dispute, uh, then they file for arbitration. We hear those and we... Again, same thing. They make their case. They leave. We ask questions. They leave the room. We discuss. We make a decision, and we award the commission to whichever party we feel uh, should be awarded the commission. Okay. And then, but which one was today? Arbitration or ethics? Ethics. Okay. Last question about that. Do you think it's pretty neutral? They tend to like the average person probably thinks, oh, they're not agents aren't going to do anything. They're just going to protect pe people in their industry. Or do you think it's the opposite where it's like teeth out? Like agents are just want to get rid of this person because they make the everybody else look bad. So um, I think that if it's a member of the public who files um, a, um, an ethics complaint, it is very likely that we find against the agent. Not necessarily because what the agent did was that egregious, but because... Um, we give a, the member of the public a lot more latitude. If it's between two agents who are filing an ethics complaint, that can go either way. But uh, we give the member of the public a lot more latitude and a lot more benefit of the doubt than we do agents. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, because they're not accustomed to the way we do business. And two, because we really want to protect the public. Uh, that is uh, in our the utmost interest for all of us is to protect the public because we want the public to have confidence in, in us and in, in our profession. Okay. Sometimes people have a, they overestimate how much the realtor is supposed to do, like know everything <laughs> about the history of the house for the, you know, 30 plus years and the remodel it went through and like the, you know, there's no way to know all that. Right. So there, there are a lot, there are a lot of things that, um, that members of the public assume or demand of their agent and some are within the scope of our profession and some are not 
and and that's really where a lot of the um, disgruntled members of the public kind of end up is where they expect their agent to do things that is beyond the scope of their license. Uh, what is the weirdest thing that happened to you in a hearing? Hmm. Okay. Um, the weirdest thing that happened to me in a hearing is um, the respondent had an attorney that represented them. Okay. And the attorney did not understand that what he was advising his client to do was illegal and um, <laughs> that was just beyond the pale. And we were just kind of left kind of throwing our hands up saying, you know, no amount of continuing education is going to really get through to this agent right. because their attorney is telling them this is okay and this is not okay. Okay. So we ended it, up disciplining them. So at it walking into an ethics hearing saying there's nothing in the law that says he can't do this. Well, but this is an ethics this is an ethics hearing. Right. He literally is admitting, oh yeah, he totally did it, but hey, there's nothing in the we're not in a courtroom. This we're code of ethics is a completely different set of standards. Right. But this was actually ethics and law. Okay. Yeah, he didn't even know. Here's my here's my because I've sat on that committee for ten years. There's a you have if an attorney comes in for either an arbitration or a ethics, usually it's because the other person badly needs help because they know they're going to lose, mm -hmm. or they're so bad they don't even understand what we're doing in there, mm -hmm. and they make it really they just make it worse. I think. Yeah, I okay. I agree with that. That doesn't mean we're not saying don't bring it. We're just telling you what we've seen in those right. without I, giving specific examples. Right. And, and I'm sure that there are attorneys out there that are very experienced and they're very good at this. Uh, just the ones that we've come across um, would have been better if they had not come. Their clients would have been better off. Okay. So <gasps> now let's roll over to foreclosures, which is probably okay. why they came to watch okay. the video. There you go. Okay, this is from Adam. This is national data. Foreclosure activity nationwide shows slight decline in April 2023. Wana, we heard, we've been hearing for months about the banks are preparing to, like they're preparing to foreclose. How do, what do the banks prepare? How do they prepare? Is there a, like a brain dance that they do? How do they prepare? Okay, so uh, they, send notices, they file, um, they file notices of default, they file notice of trustee sale, they do all that. Um, you know, I kind of understand what people are talking about out there, to be honest with you. I think that they feel that um, even though the banks could have uh, moved forward with these filings in the past, they have not, and now, for reasons of their own, uh, are choosing to move forward with these filings. I'm less than convinced about that, um, just because banks are big bureaucracies, and I just think um, they kind of run like a machine, not necessarily a well-oiled machine, but a yeah. machine, and there's a process, and, it, and, the, and the transactions just go through the process. Okay, here's a quote from the article. Foreclosure activity continues to stabilize and even correct itself in 2023, with April showing a 10% decrease in overall activity after a 20% increase last month, said Rob Barber, Chief Executive CEO at Atom. While there is no apparent indication of a continued decline in the number of foreclosures, it's important to note that this month of April typically exhibits a recurring trend of decreased activity. However, this trend underscores the significance of monitoring foreclosure rates, identifying any potential market shift trends. Okay, that's all. That last part's all like BS stuff. But what is foreclosure activity? Because the average person, they don't understand. Like when you get foreclosed, that means the like people imagine like you someone knocks on your door and they go we don't, we they they like slap a piece of paper down and goes the bank owns the house get out right but when for what's foreclosure activity because some some the numbers they report is not the numbers of people that they walked in and went boom we own, bank owns the house no so they're reporting uh, on the properties that are anywhere in the process so anywhere from being um, from from the notice of default all the way to uh, notice of trustee and the actual trustee deed sale. So th these pr these properties are in, in, in any stage of that process. And when you're counting all that, you're, you're right. You're going to have a lot 
uh, relatively speaking, but by the time you get to the very end, the properties actually sell at the trustee sale. It's a very small fraction because those things have been resolved. Okay. Here's some numbers. We're going to go over a bunch of numbers. Uh, foreclosure starts. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a specific thing. Declined 7% from last month. What do we call a foreclosure start? A notice of default. In Nevada. Okay. The reason why they say foreclosure starts because they have other words for it in other places. Mm -hmm. In some states, they have you have to go to a court and file. We mm -hmm. don't do that in Nevada. It's statutory. We just mm -hmm. file paperwork publicly and mm -hmm. in a thing, and then that, that starts a clock. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a like pre-foreclosure step, which are people have just missed payments. Mm -hmm. And the, some of the banks report that is just, you know, the, 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 lo the late loan, payments. Well, the, the loan being delinquent, yes. 30, 60, 90 day late, right? right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, so it was down 7% from last month. Uh, now, this is completions. Mm -hmm. This is the very end of the process. Now, we'll talk about this and we'll talk about something interesting because it says foreclosure completions decreased 39% monthly. Lenders repossessed 2,919 U.S. properties through completed foreclosures in April, down 39% from last month, but up 3% from last year. Okay, 2,900 only in one month. There were probably foreclosures on every street corner. I mean, there can't be 2,900 streets in the whole US, right? There's probably one in every street. <laughs> so, you know, clearly that's very few foreclosures that happen across the okay. US. Okay. And you know, it matters. It's ten a day. Right. So so it matters if, if it's you, it matters if it's the house next door to you. But other than that, you know, the numbers clearly are um, anecdotal more than anything else at this point. Yeah, it's like two it's hundred a day. It's two per state mm -hmm. per per day. Right. So the California would have like two. Um, if you drove all around town to try to find these you would never find them. That's how few there are. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing is the timeline. We did a video on this. 950 days. Right, but it's this, like three years from the start of filing. This is nationally. So nationally. Uh, it is different in every state, and, and they're just looking at it nationally. Yeah, but Hawaii, New York, New Jersey, Illinois are much like five years. Right. And then some other states are like it probably take honestly takes a year in Nevada with all the you know, you have to be late, then you have to get all the things filed, then they have to do the mediation. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to go through some specific numbers because this is going to actually show an idea because there's a bunch of people out there, crash bros, making mm -hmm. videos. They just made one talking about because that because six months ago, it was all of the new homes that are just sitting there that the, the builders were just adding up and going to flood the market. They were all coordinating like on the phone going, hey, let's flood April 3rd, let's put all of them on the market and crash the market. Let's show those real estate agents, right? And and homeowners, we're going to show those guys. And it never happened. And so now they turn to foreclosures were like, the, one of the videos I saw from a crash bow was like they're 10 times higher than some other, I don't know what number they were picking because we're going to actually show you the chart. You're going you're gonna to have a hard time finding one time, like zero times higher. Well, okay. I mean, so... I wouldn't even argue about the 10 times higher. It's like, okay, fine. If you had no foreclosures last month and you have 10 foreclosures this month, okay, that's 10 times as many. But, you know, if you're looking at a city of 2 million people, having 10 foreclosures, big deal. So. <laughs> okay. We're going to use the foreclosure. Now, we are not number one or number two in foreclosures. We are, in, I think we were 7 to 11 mm -hmm. nationally. It, we were in there. Maybe it was 8. Okay. But we're kind of in the toward the top. Now, this I'll put this chart up. This is the city of Las Vegas. Notice defaults, trustee sales, and trustee deeds. The trustee deed is the final end of the foreclosure. Now, if you look all the way to the left, notice the defaults. You can see all the way where it says 22, and then that's basically uh, 23 at the very end. And then you look to the right, you can see there were many more notice of defaults filed in like 13, 14, 15, 16, and everything. Um, and remember that the, the number of trustee sales that we take, we get, it, there's a lag. So it's actually, you know, looking back before that. And then you get the no trustee sale. And it looks like there's more, but the scale is different. 
Remember the scale on that that first chart is 2,000. The second one's 400. The last one's 300. So when you're looking over there and you see that 300 trustee deeds foreclosures, you go all the way to the right and look down. It's like a little bitty, and that's for the whole month. Like we don't even have we have a small number. So when you when you when they talk about foreclosures are up, they're talking about up from 2020 and 21 when there were no foreclosures because uh, banks were not in the mood to foreclose on a bunch of people. And what we end up finding 96 to 97 people of percent of all those people resolved. Mm -hmm. They either sold the house, became current, or negotiated some thing and they got everyone got back current on the house. Right. And that's I think what the people are remembering. They're remembering the report of three or four million people behind on payments. There was no foreclosures. They were just late payments. They all, it, it took about two years, but they all got resolved. Right. Literally all got resolved. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good thing. We want people to um, have good experiences with home ownership and work things out with the bank. Okay, so here's the actual data for Vegas. Um, now the top, you'll see, we've got the whole county in here, but we've been just doing Las Vegas on our updates and everything. Mm -hmm. So the trade, if you go all the way to the, uh, to the left, notice the defaults. So we're 68, and this I think is April, 68 in April, notice the defaults filed, right? But then the notice of trustees was 33. So remember, these, this notice of trustees is from months ago, mm -hmm. three, four, five, six, seven, eight months ago. And you can see that the numbers drop off. And then you get to the next month where it says trustees 11. Mm -hmm. that, that means there were 11 foreclosures. There were 11 actual trustee deeds that took place. 11 is like one every three days. Right, and that's for the whole month. That's for the, that's for the entire month of April. Um, so that means in a how, housing market of 400,000 houses, in two days in a row, there were none. And then mm -hmm. on the third day, there was one, right? Mm -hmm. And if you see trailing 12 months, there were 150 total, mm -hmm. which is about the same, right? It's uh, between, you know, one every two or three days. Um, we had that one or, in one or two days back in 8, 9, 10, 11, mm -hmm. 12, right? That, back then, we were having, like, you could go down to the trustee sale. There'd be 40 people down there. Everyone's got a couple million bucks. And people mm -hmm. are just like, Getting houses, you know, forty, fifty thousand under mm -hmm. market value, paying cash for them, right? Right. Okay. Now, if you go down to the bottom left there, uh, foreclosure sales, REO, City of Las Vegas. Um, now, this is the actual uh, the 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 REO sales that mm -hmm. happened each month, mm -hmm. and you can see that we we have not in the last year had more than one a day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best we've had is we had 15 in April. And you're probably wondering, well, how do we have 150 trustee deeds, but then we don't have 150 foreclosure sales? So what's happening to those homes sometimes, even though it goes to the, there's a trustee deed where it ownership is forced away, which is what we, what the average person calls foreclosure, mm -hmm. right? They oh, no longer own the house because they they didn't make payments or whatever. So so what are some things that can happen besides it just ending up being put on the market and sold? So um first of all, you know that there could have been some sort of error and that it could get reversed. Okay. So that that's a possibility. It's very rare, but it does happen. Um or the property is uh the the buyer keeps it uh either to move into it and live in it or to rent it out. So um those are possibilities. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, I was actually down there one time and one of the guys literally said, Hey guys, I'm just, he was one of the regulars. He said, I'm just letting you all know this one house. I'm going to, I want to move. I want to live in it. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get people not to bid it up. Right. And I'm not saying, so they actually had this happen in Northern California. A bunch of the guys who bid at the trustee mm -hmm. sale mm -hmm. all got together the night before. And they had like the five or six houses or the number of houses that were coming. And they what they did is they said, look, let's not all go down there and bid each other up. Let's just do this. Let's agree right now that we're each going to get like one house at the opening bid. And we all, we'll, we'll, we'll keep track and we'll create this little like uh, cartel. 
and we'll walk you out there and we'll just one personal bid. No one else bids. You get the house, then you leave. Then another guy bids and, and everyone gets a house cheap. That way we're not bidding each other up on these houses because it just, we're defeating the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So it took literally three or four houses of being bid on where the trustee went, okay, guys, I've been watching you do this for years and th you know this never happens. So finally the word, someone finally acknowledged, they said, hey, you know, we, this is what we did, but there's nothing illegal about it. Guess what? It was illegal. Like literally they said, it was not illegal for us to do this, but it was illegal. There's like, there was some law that literally said you couldn't like agree to not mm -hmm. do this. And they, they, they formulated this thing to do it. And it was, ended up being a big deal. Like mm -hmm. they got, there was like arrests. They were fined. It was like, you know, it, uh, some of them were banned. I don't know if there's prison time or not, but it was pretty bad. And, and I'm not saying that happens, but I know two cases mm -hmm. of the trustee sale, the trustee sale stories, I'll tell. Mm -hmm. One was, I was down there when it happened. Some guy showed up who had never been there before. And one of the regulars who worked for a company where he would, you know, in a given day, he would get four or five, right? Uh, and they were a big flipping company, national, like kind of like a national company. He just saw the guy and he goes, who is that guy? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, he shouldn't. I don't want him down here messing up our thing. So the guy started bidding on this one house and it was kind of, a, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of room in the deal. And he basically bid him up. <laughs> and then at one point the guy, he just said, I'm out. He, he, he passed and the guy bought the, bought the house and he left. So he put the cash on left and everyone was like, dude, why did you bid up so high? He goes, I just didn't like that guy. He just kind of looked like a jerk. <laughs> And he goes, I'm glad I didn't get stuck with it because we'd have lost money. We wouldn't have been able to make money in that. And he said, you know, the problem is he won't make money on it. He'll probably never come back here. <laughs> and then there was another time where literally a guy just, he came up and said, this is me. This is my son. This is my story. I've never been here before, but this is why I'm bidding on this house. And I mean, this is, I mean, you know, the kind of people that are down there. Mm -hmm. There's, and everyone just kind of looked and went. Okay. And then the, the, the gal wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. So she walked out and it was like the third house. And she said the address and he goes, yeah, I'll, a dollar over whatever the opening bid was. And everyone just kind of looked around. No one said anything. And she goes, okay, like going once, going twice, sold for whatever amount. He went and got the house and he just said, hey, thank you, everybody and left. So it was, uh, I don't, I, it was something like it was personal to him. Like it had, I don't know what the deal was, but he just said, hey, this is like my house or something. Mm -hmm. I want it back or something like that. But yeah. Well, you know, look, uh, everybody's got their reasons and I don't know, um, you know, it didn't sound like it was a, like they colluded to do anything. They just chose not to participate. Okay. When you hear foreclosures are up 20% nationwide mm -hmm. and then people go, oh, foreclosures, up, they make a video, foreclosures up 20%. Oh my God. So the housing is obviously going to crash now because 20% more foreclosures. Those are just going to flood the market, right? But we're, that's an off, like in Vegas, it was 11 in a month. We had 11 foreclosures in a month. Mm -hmm. So we get two more. It's 20% higher, <laughs> right? Right. That, that was my point earlier when I said, well, you know, it's up 10, you know, it's up 10%. You know, so if you had 10, 10 houses last month and you have 11 this month, oh, it's up 10%, big deal. And then here's the thing is the crash guys and the housing haters – they never do videos when foreclosure rate went down um, like year over year, month over month. They just skip that month, right? Right. And then, or they'll do a video on one state where foreclosures were up 17% mm -hmm. in that state. They'll just ignore everything else. And so all you're being bombarded with is foreclosures, foreclosures are up and up. And you're like, foreclosures are up every month. It's, you know, and you start filling your head with all this, you know, these beliefs. Well, it's important to understand the context, you know, and we talk about this all the time. Like I said, you know, if last month there were 10 and this month there are 11, okay, they went up 10%, but it's still nothing. So context makes all the difference. If there are so many foreclosures, why are there no houses? Like the foreclosures go into the MLS. Why are there no, there's well, just nothing in the MLS? Well, you know, the foreclosures sometimes go in the MLS and some people just keep them. Yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is if there's so many of them, they would be in the, we would have inventory. We would right. have like a substantial, we'd right. be able to make offers on these and buy these things, but that's they're not true. there. They're just not enough. Nope. Nope. And that, you know, that's a good thing. We're glad that people are able to keep their homes and, 
and they can make their payments and um, you know enjoy the the benefits of home ownership. I predict this is my prediction. Not only will we never see the level of foreclosures we saw uh, oh seven eight nine ten eleven during that time frame. We're the we so we just found out today we did the over forty two percent of all homes are owned free and clear. Right. Forty two percent. Yeah, I was surprised because the last time we looked at it, the numbers were from 2020 and it was like 37 or 38 percent. And, yeah. you know, these numbers are 42 percent and that's huge. Uh, now, I think part of the reason is because, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that happened during the pandemic. One of the things that happened is a lot of people um, kind of reevaluate their whole life, right? And maybe they um, they retired, they paid off the house, or they uh, retired and they sold the house and then used the proceeds to buy a house uh, uh, cash in, in a different area. So there are a lot of reasons for that. But whatever the reasons, I think that, you know, 42% of the housing stock being free and clear, I mean, that, that's just unheard of. It is unheard of. It was 18%. When the market collapsed, 06 to 08, and it was 18%. It's right. 42% now. Because remember, we are a debt-loving nation, right? We buy everything on credit. Yeah. So, um, you know, the idea that 42% of the homes are free and clear, I think, is phenomenal. I think that's a lot of support for real estate values. Um, I think it's really telling about what's going to happen going forward with inventory. I think with so many homes being free and clear... You know, I just don't see inventory coming back anytime soon. I think these people are going to sit on their homes. They're they're free and clear. So why would they put them on the market and sell them and then go out and buy something else when there isn't any inventory? So I think that there's a lot tied up with this lack of inventory. There are a lot of reasons. And I think the amount of um, homes that are owned debt-free is part of that picture. Yeah, I think I think that for me that's the big thing. We have so many people that own their house free and clear. Forty-two percent. Mm-hmm. The other fifty-eight percent have loans. But we know of the other fifty-eight percent that have loans, like seventy or eighty percent of them have under four percent, and ninety-nine percent have under six percent. Mm-hmm. Only people who have over six percent are the borrowers who borrowed within the last eight months, and then uh, who didn't refi when they dropped below. And not all borrowers did, because if you get a V, you know, the VA rates were, you know, 5.3% not that long ago, and you could still get, you know, 5.3% loan. Uh, Jumbo loans were actually pretty low. It's Mm -hmm. only loans that were high were poor credit borrowers who were in the, in the wrong number, you know, wrong amount of down payment. Mm -hmm. You were not putting in, you know, you're either putting too little or not enough or too much or whatever. And then you were kind of getting stuck at this interest rate. Remember, the rate they quote is not the rate for everybody. If they say interest rates went to 6.72% today, that's the average 30-year fixed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thirty average 30-year fix is a Fannie Freddie, which are the most expensive loans. Mm-hmm. Because remember, they're and that's the 30-year. The 15 is less, FHA is less, Jumbo is less, VA is less, and portfolio loans that mm-hmm. banks are giving to their portfolio clients it is less. So literally when they, when they talk about these rates, uh, it, all the other thing too, is when they were, when rates were like at three, those were the highest rates. There were still people getting a lot lower rates than 3%. Right. Although the, the spreads were a lot different. You weren't getting 1% less. You're getting like a half a percent less. Right. So I think that's why I don't think foreclosures are coming back because people who own their home free and clear don't get foreclosed. Mm-hmm. I don't think, um, that people are going to sell because, you know, all the people on that watch the channel that, you know, regular, a lot of them are investors that you, you, you get to hear, you know, about properties you own and things like that. Um, I ran into a guy yesterday. He told me he has five houses and we were talking and he goes, yeah, I sold, I sold one. I'm selling another one. I go, Oh, so you're going to like pay the, the capital gains taxes and everything on He goes, no, I don't pay any capital gains taxes. I go, why is that? He goes, they're in a self-directed IRA. <laughs> so they're in an IRA the IRA, it's all tax free. Now, when he eventually, when the money goes back in the IRA and then he pulls it out at some point to live off it, he'll pay taxes as income, mm-hmm. but he doesn't actually pay uh, 
So I don't know if that's better because maybe you're better just taking the 15% or whatever and then having the rest free and clear. He's got to take it in his income. So maybe he ends up paying more at the end. I don't know. But, you know, so there are some people that are obviously some people are selling for whatever reason. But I just don't see what happened last time forced to sell. Right. All right. So what do you think? What's going on out there for you? Do you see, you know, have you seen foreclosures in your neighborhood? Um, have you seen the postings? What's going on wherever you are? Tell us where you are and tell us what you're, where you're seeing. Uh, we love hearing from you and we appreciate it. Oh yeah. If you have video, like secret video of the banks <laughs> preparing to foreclose, like what goes on behind the scenes, like, you know, do they get together and chant something before they foreclose? I would, we would like to see that. I would search YouTube for the videos of the banks preparing to foreclose. Yes, please, please amuse Todd with the videos. Yeah, I would like so, to see that. So, um, anyway, thank you for watching. We appreciate it. Please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like the video, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.